Discretionary listener participation is advised for the following pro wrestling podcast. Sharif don't like it. Rock in the Stick to Wrestling podcast. I want to thank the class for writing that song about their favorite podcast, Stick to Wrestling. Where if you give us 60 minutes, perhaps indeed, we'll give you a Wicked Good and Raw Bone podcast. My name is John McAdam. I want to invite everyone to join the Stick to Wrestling Facebook group. We talk about wrestling, talk about other stuff, results, pictures, you name it. It's there. Just ask to join and you're in. Speaking of the group, I want to thank uh, Mark Rock and Roland for a couple of things. Number one. He was generous enough to donate to this podcast. Um, if you would like to do the same, uh, pro wrestling archives at gmail.com at PayPal and just give me money, man. Hey, and Mark also, um, much to my does that work? Well, it, it does work, yes. Oh man, my, my guest can't wait to get in here. Right. Uh, now just remind me. Remind me of that if you ask if I have anything to plug. <laughs> you just, got it, pal. I'm just going to plea for money. There you go. <laughs> and that, that's that's what I'm basically doing. I'm, I'm pleading for money. Please, for God's sake. Yeah. I, I do this for free. Um, and Mark dug up a video yeah. of me at the Smoky Mountain Fan Week heel barbecue thing from 1994 i haven't seen it yet but i'm terrified this is my version of the trump p tape i just found out about this today <laughs> he unearthed a picture of me being 29 years old and apparently i'm cutting a promo and i was still pretty wired when i was 28 29 so i'm dreading this but with that i want to bring on our guest mr scott corner scott thanks for coming back Oh, absolutely! Thank you for having me back. I was starting to starting to worry that I had, had done something wrong the last time I was on. You've here. done plenty wrong, pal. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. I, I, they, um, well, you you started off by quoting the Clash, and I promised not to hijack the show with uh, Clash. Oh, that's goes, right! Like I need I to do a stick um, song or something. Rem- but go ahead. <laughs> well. I, I think I hijacked the last time I was on. Uh, d- talked more about Ramones than I did about wrestling, and uh, but I I am starting my own stick to Ramones uh, podcast soon. Get out of here! <laughs> no, no, I I, yeah, I am kidding. Okay, yeah. that wasn't that wasn't funny enough. You actually believed. Me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but um, I, I am I'm glad to be back. Thank you. I am. I'm glad to have you back. The the Ramones and the Clash have something in common, and that is that I've seen each band at least twice, and they stunk every single time. And these are two bands I absolutely <laughs> love. So, yeah, I give the Clash a lot of credit. I only saw them after Mick Jones was out of the band, and um, I, I I pretend that it was a fantastic show. It was a it was an okay show. It was a good show. It wasn't the breathtaking clash experience that I that I was uh, cheated out of. I guess I'll say, but I saw many good Ramones. Shows. Are you saying, I, and that's I the differ- thing. I, I've ta- talked to people who have see, had been to so, so many. I've talked to so many people that have had positive Ramones show experience. That I, I think I just got unlucky three times. <laughs> well, that, that's entirely possible. It's certainly possible in the realm of wrestling you know? yeah <laughs> it really is you you're know thrilled, you're thrilled if you, i went to an aew show a couple of weeks ago in albany it's the one they don't talk about oh. <laughs> the, one, the one where nobody showed up uh they kept not only is this the suspended wrestlers if i may sidebar here the suspended wrestlers but half the regular roster was just left at home what was it just uh, a they, house they show drew, no, it was a, it was a, they don't do house shows. Okay. It was a live episode of Dynamite and they didn't draw anything. They, they promoted it very, very poorly in the area. And all they were interested in doing was talking about Arthur Ashe Stadium the next week. But, um, you know, guys I was dreading seeing like Orange Cassidy and uh, so forth weren't even on the show. Oh, man. Uh, no FTR, no FTR, no, you know. On and on and on. Not to mention, as as I just did, the the, the guys that were that are all suspended. You know, you got to see MJF. We got to see a couple other people. They give Wardlow. They gave him the spot that they used to do at old WWF tapings, where he doesn't appear for the entire show, 
and then he comes running out during a dark match at the end. <laughs> All right. That seems like a waste of a plane ticket. Gets a big pop. <laughs> oh. but, yeah, it was a, it, it was such a, you know, I was looking forward to some kind of something. Nothing remarkable happened. Nothing completely insane. But I could not believe how uh, how empty it was in there. Yeah. And that's the show. Like I said, it, it aired live. And no one, no one mentioned it. You know, no, no. It was like it didn't even happen. Uh, I even left. I even left uh, in the middle of Dynamite to go up the street and watch a concert. <laughs> and then I came back at like ten ten forty five, and it was still going on. You are a rambling <laughs> man, sir. Leaving the wrestling to go to see a concert, then back to the wrestling. What you talked about there, uh, it reminds me. The concert was so much better than the wrestling. Who was playing, or do you do? We, will we even know who they are? You may know who who she is. Her name is Saint Vincent. I do not know who she is. She's opening. She's currently opening. She's been around for quite a few years now, but she's currently opening for the Roxy Music Tour. And I saw her on Monday at Madison Square Garden, and then I happened to find out that she was playing right up the street from AEW in Albany on Wednesday. And I was so impressed with her on Monday. I said, oh, go to see her in a small club. Absolutely. And I'm really glad that I did. She's like a female. I, I compare her currently because I think she changes her musical style a lot. But she came across to me like a female version of Prince. And that's that's high praise in my book. <laughs> I would say so. You know, you we talked about like you know, I, in one of the class shows I went to was one of the ones where it was like Joe Strummer and friends, and it absolutely sucked. And I should have known it was going to suck. And the other time I saw yeah. them was like late in the combat rock tour, which you know the, the band was falling apart, and everyone was exhausted, and the the mm-hmm. show at the Boston Orpheum sucked. I can't believe that was over forty years ago. You, yeah, can you believe it? You, you, you can, can count things like that in decades yeah, now. Four <laughs> decades. Oh, four decades. Wow. We talked about the Facebook group. We put up wrestling results. And sometimes I'll be like, oh, yeah, I went to this NWA show in 1989. Everyone's like, oh, my God, that's a fantastic yeah. show. And it's like, no, it sucked. <laughs> it was just another night mm-hmm. on the road for these guys, and they mailed it. Yeah. And I'm sure that happens in every entertainment uh Oh yeah, oh yeah. All you have to do is look at those those WWWF results that <laughs> we grew up on. You know? Well, those don't you were good. you were a mile away from Jack Witchie's uh, arena, and look at most of the results. You go, yeah, I don't think I'd I'd walk the mile to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Turco in the main event. Oh, it wasn't that bad. It, it was close to that bad. <laughs> wasn't that bad especially in the end i mean they would have like yeah. ted dibiase against bulldog brower and then like four joe Ooh. turco level matches yeah exactly what was funny was i i was told that they they ran did they ran friday night they ran every single friday night with the exception of the friday night after the blister of 78 until the place okay. burned down wow but albany which is not that far away. Two hours. Used to also run, yeah, used to run the uh, the Armory, Washington Avenue Armory, which is a beautiful building, and I'm actually going to see wrestling there on Friday. Who are you seeing there? <laughs> Believe it or not, it's Impact's number one show of the year. Whatever the, whatever they call their main pay-per-view of the year, it's in Albany at, at the Armory on Friday. <laughs> All right. Nice old I guess school you didn't get building. the memo. Um, <laughs> a beautiful old building. Uh, but they used to run on Friday the same night that they were running at Jack Witchie's. And and Albany really didn't do much better than than Massachusetts. <laughs> it was like two two battling C teams. <laughs> oh. and I think they ran New London on the same night. That's crazy. Yeah, and you know the <laughs> stories about these guys, you know, racing from one town to the other to make the town, and you know, crazy yeah. old days of old school wrestling, man. Speaking of wrestling, uh, as you like it, or, <laughs> or whatever, they, whatever the Smoky Mountains used uh, 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 motto used to be, wrestling the way it used to be and the way you like it. That's it. That's right. Yeah, we're going to talk a little Smoky Mountain wrestling today. 
Scott, in right around summer of 1991, I, I start hearing that Jim Cornette, of all people, was going to start his own promotion, primarily in the old Southeast Championship Wrestling territory is going to be based in Knoxville. He's going to work the surrounding towns. And it was so intriguing because Jim Cornette, I mean, I've been around Jim Cornette. I've hung around Jim Cornette. No one gets this bit or got this business in 1991 like Jim Cornette did. And I also heard, and it was turned out to be true, he had a real backer, Rick Rubin, a guy who was A, a wrestling fan, and B, had plenty of money. So very hopeful right. from the start. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the funny about the Rick Rubin thing, I don't think anyone – uh, I, I'm, I'm certain you know, certain names you can you can speculate on who knew about Rick Rubin, but almost nobody did. And I certainly never heard his name mentioned until Smokey was was done. He he was very much, a, a, you know, just connected directly to Jim and, you know, might have taken a meeting with Sandy Scott <laughs> maybe once. But um, and I think he is on the record that he only only physically was present at one show or one set of tapings or something. But yeah, very interesting that, that that was kept under wraps for almost, I would say the entire run of Smoky Mountain Wrestling for you. I think it was kept under wraps until he stopped funding the promotion. Like I knew that they had a backer. <laughs> I didn't know who it was. And that, that led yeah. to, I mean, that really was a kick in the, the kidneys for Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I mean, after that, it yeah. was over. But that, that's three years later, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about what led up to fall of 1992. That's right. Um, I'll tell you, and you know, Jim Cornette, he starts his own promotion. And Scott, you know about this. And I'm not trying to be insulting, not at all. I mean, but back <laughs> in the 90s, early 90s. That's my job. <laughs> To be insulted. There you go, and you're good at it. Um, mm. I mean, Jim was promoting in the land that time forgot. You and I have been out there. We were uh, part of the 1994 Smoky Mountain fan trip. And, I mean, yeah. you get to these towns, and it feels like you're in a Twilight Zone episode because that's what it looks like. It looks like something that, um, you know, from the <laughs> 60s, from the, from the late 50s. I thought it was uh... – you know, looking back even then, but looking back on it now, I mean, it was culture shock for people like us. <laughs> I live in Rome, New York. That's hardly a bustling metropolis, you know, <laughs> where, where, <laughs> where where we're we're cynical and, and, and world, you know, world weary and all this. But I would get down there on those trips and just be in awe because uh, those people made more more noise in it high school gym than than madison square garden and i over the years I, I came to liken it to the fact that and and i've heard jim say a similar thing about it which is you don't get rocks you don't get a rock star in your town you don't get big movie stars walking around your town but you get the stars of smoky mountain wrestling that you see on your tv every week right in your town no matter how small you know and uh and, and uh Right when we were, as fans, getting kind of cynic, oh, we're so smart. You know, we read The Observer. We're very smart. We're hip to what's going on. It was truly exciting to see people that still believed, and they absolutely believed. They did, and I remember going to – what was the name of that crazy small town that they went to? Pike, Not Pikeville. I, I'm told it's actually a nice small town, but Barberville, Barberville. Uh, comes up in my. Yeah, I'm I'm told that was one of their nicer towns. We never got to go to like uh, Wise, Kentucky, or or or, or uh, Pikeville, where they had the bluegrass brawls, uh, where they had some really really uh, <laughs> uh, rough uh, confrontations, especially years later when the gangsters were <laughs> oh god, were being booked. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we're 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 jumping all over the map i'm sorry but uh oh that's we okay got to this is see, fun. we got to see the first big splash that the gangsters made uh, an interview they did with jim ross in knoxville at one of their big super cards and uh 
New Jack got done talking to Ross and everybody's jaw was on the floor. <laughs> oh, this will be really exciting if we don't all get killed. You know? <laughs> I, I had seen the gangsters. I had gotten a, a Smoky Mountain tape and I had seen a couple of their vignettes. And I get to I think on this I think this year me and my friends all like kind of used louisville as a hub and we went to smoky mountain from there and i was telling them Hmm. watch out for these guys this guy this new jack guy is like nothing you've ever seen before and i remember i was on this trip i'm sitting behind this guy and his girlfriend and he's yelling something at new jack and new jack yells back at him you know how'd you like he's with his girlfriend and new jack yells back at him how'd you like to see your girlfriend with a hot black a hot sweaty black man on top of her and this guy <laughs> literally yeah. he, he, his his back and his neck went from white to beat red it was a it was unbelievable <laughs> to see and his girlfriend's just like sit down yep. sit down <laughs> she never answered the question it, by the way yeah yeah even even before they hit the scene uh, scene there was there was that kind of heat uh, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, almost from the start. Uh, but uh, yeah, it certainly uh, kicked into a, 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 a high gear when, when they showed up. Well, we were talking about Barberville. The woman Jim Cornette would eventually marry uh, and is still married to today, Stacy. You know, Stacy was from yeah. San Francisco. She was not from Barberville, Kentucky. Big difference. And she was someone's mm. valet. And she's out doing her valet thing. And there are these people in the front row who are just screaming at her, right? And Stacy turns yeah. around and she sticks her tongue out at them. What they were not expecting was their first ever look at a pierced tongue. It was like huh? she unplugged them. They were just like, oh, my yeah. God. they went into a stunned silence. It was absolutely awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The reaction of those fans, a real reaction. I, you know, like I said, it, it was one thing to go see ECW where everybody was sort of, you know, half in, in on the joke. Not that they couldn't get heat or do things like that but the real reaction that you got in the southern towns was really something to behold it was very very exciting yeah i went to fan now talk about being a big smoky mountain wrestling fan right at the time i lived in drake massachusetts which is a little bit out of boston it's probably it was like a 45 minute trip to the airport in manchester new hampshire and twice i got an air on an airplane and went from Manchester, New Hampshire to Knoxville, Tennessee for Smoky Mountain Wrestling because I liked it that much. And believe it or not, back in 1994, 1995, there were no direct flights from Manchester, New Hampshire to Knoxville, Tennessee. So it was a long trip. It was a lot of traveling. It was a lot of driving around. Uh, You haven't lived until you've gone to the show in the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis, back to your hotel room in in Louisville, and that's a long six-hour trip, man. Yeah, that that, that was the aspect of uh, being on the road and 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 uh, the the being on a, the Southern Wrestling Circuit that <laughs> they didn't exactly prepare all these fans for. You say, oh yeah, you're gonna have a six-hour drive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, we we commonplace commonplace to everybody working the show. Yes, <laughs> and not, and and we were being chauffeured. Yes. You know? <laughs> well, some but some people were driving. You guys were driving, but you know, uh, with us, we we were either on a bus or in a van or something like that. And uh, and uh, still, people were complaining. Oh my God, this town is three hours away. Mm. <laughs> we just did this yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I the, the first I went in 94 or 95. 94 I was part of the Smoky Mountain Fan Week thing. I was out there for 11 days. <laughs> I got there on a yeah. Friday and the Monday a, a week from Monday I went back home and I I have no problem telling you. I I remember I think I was hanging out with you that and you and a few other people that Saturday after like the the trip we went home on a Sunday, that's right. And Saturday we got back from the matches and we're hanging out in a hotel room watching uh, tapes. I'm pretty sure you were there and all of us were like I'm glad this is over. It was fun, but I'm I've had it. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. I it was, it was. I think that year I I went for the whole the whole experience, the whole week, and uh, I think the first year, the ninety three, I was there for a little over half of it. I didn't I didn't do the whole week, so I didn't I didn't get burned out on it or anything. I could hardly wait to come back. I say to this day, uh, I never. Uh, excuse me, maybe once and only a few weeks ahead of that, I went to a WWF ha- house show in Utica. No, it wasn't a house show. It was a raw taping. It wasn't live, um, but they taped raw there. And who comes walking up the aisle but Jim Cornette and the Heavenly Bodies. Now, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't gotten, I wouldn't get the Observer until next Saturday. So it was a complete surprise to me to see them walk up the aisle and going, I'm I'm going to Knoxville in two weeks. What the hell are they doing here? You know, <laughs> but um, but other than that, at that show, I met the first ever hardcore fan that I've ever met. In in other words, the 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 first time I ever read it, I ever met another newsletter uh, subscriber or reader that you could talk about inside stuff with. And I didn't know him very well. And we happened to be wearing, <laughs> uh, both wearing a Terry Funk t-shirt. So we, we stood out in the uh, Utica auditorium. But um, at, yeah, that fast forward two weeks later, I'm in Knoxville. And it was real. you know, a lot of the stuff that I, I had never seen Tammy, Tammy Fitch, Tammy Sitch rather, until I walked into the airport. I heard about her read about her, said, oh, wow, she's really something. She just started, you know. I had heard about Chris Candido. So my first time in Knoxville, I fly down to Knoxville. I'm at the airport. Oh, there's Tom Pritchard over there. Here's somebody else over here. And I see Tammy, the 19-year-old, whatever she was, you know. And I, my first reaction was, wow, these Southern women are gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's incredible, you know, and, uh, and then somebody, somebody from Philadelphia, a, a fan from Philadelphia started to give me the Iggy about her, you know, he's, he's going to oh, watch out for her, you know? <laughs> oh boy. Who was your fa- friend in Utica? A uh, friend in Utica. I, I, I never got to know him all that well, but he did a newsletter. His name is Paul MacArthur. He did a newsletter called Wrestling Perspective. I remember that Dave newsletter. Scholar. Yeah, yeah, very literate. Very, I, I think he's still a professor up here around Utica. But yeah, he was the first, the first person I ever met that was a, uh, you know, I was, I was doing a deep dive. What year was that? Oh, that's ninety three. I started subscribing to the to to the Observer, you know, which just op- broke open a whole new world in eighty eight. So, so there's a good five years that I had all this knowledge and nobody to blab it to, you know, know, I literally never met a hardcore fan or went to anything other than the WWF show until that year. And then I went, Oh my, now I've got to go to Philadelphia and check out ECW. I've got to go here and there. And, um, you know, that, that's where it got out of control. (laughs) I tell people, I tell people, um, when they talk about their memories of wrestling, I said, there's a period of time where every boy gets into wrestling and then they gradually, you know, they gradually age out of it, get out of it. And and there's some of us that don't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, typically a wrestling fan, or I, I was told this back in the eighties, you have a three year window. And by the end of that three years, you've oh, seen everything. Everything's getting rehashed. You, you, you kind of grow out of it. Yeah. I still like to go to a live show. I'm rarely pleased <laughs> when I go, but I couldn't believe how dull that AEW show was. <laughs> I think you just got unlucky. I, should, I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be surprised. I've been to many TV tapings, you know, or live shows. But yeah, I was expecting something really crazy and. Uh, Whatever. And it was just another <laughs> Wednesday night or whatever it was. You know, we talk about like uh, get getting the observer for the first time and getting a little bit smart for the first time. There is a downside to that. Okay. For example, that my number one example. Just one? 
Well, my, yeah, really. My number one example is when uh, the Midnight Express were wrestling on TV and Pauly Dangerously and the original Midnight Express come out. Everyone else was shocked. I knew it was happening. And I was like watching it. And uh, I was like, yeah. I wish I didn't know because I wish I wish I could pop just like everyone else. I didn't know all the details, but I knew Paul Lee, uh, Dennis Condry and Randy Rose were going to be there and they're going to beat the crap out of Cornette. Number two, I mean, yeah. the, back to Cornette joining the WWF. I mean, I get a call on Monday night before the before Raw is on, and hey, you've met Dennis Carluso, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Not not enough times, but I had I enjoyed my few brief uh, interactions with oh, him. Dennis, Dennis was amazing. Den, I could have my own Dennis podcast, not uh, an episode about Dennis, but like a weekly one hour show where I talk about crazy Dennis <laughs> stuff. But he calls me up and, you know, I, I was married at the time. My wife picks up. And he's like, oh, it's Dennis. And he's like, Joe, Johnny Mac, guess what, man? Hell fucking froze over. I'm like, what are you talking about? Guess who's going to be on Monday Night Raw tonight? Uh, this is after Waller. <laughs> So he said, he says, hell froze over again. And I'm like, I'm like, who? And he's like, Jim Cornette, man. He's going to be managing Yokozuna. And I'm like, well, wow. How, I'm the same way I was with Waller. I was like, well, that's the end of the Memphis promotion, right? And he's like, I don't know. I'm like, well, how's Jim Cornette going to run Smoky Mountain Wrestling and be part of the WWF? Like, what yeah. did he pull the plug in his own promotion? No, they just worked yeah, something we- out. Yeah, when when he walked out in Utica, I'm going to do, what? <laughs> Are they going to cancel my trip? You know? <laughs> you know, you were talking about Tammy Sitch. I remember being at one of Dennis's shows and Candida was wrestling, and one of my buddies, like, you know, she's on the other side. We're we're in high school bleachers, and I'm on one side, she's on the other. And one of my friends says, you know, hey, check out Chris Candido's girlfriend, and she had to be, I want to say, 18 at the time. And she's like, whoa, yep. I wouldn't mind being Chris Candido right now. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing that, that I remember from a, a, a TV taping in Saltville, Virginia, a typical small town. You were there. I was there. You know, a, <clears throat> lots of crazy stuff went down at that taping. A Reginald Denny style beating of Ricky Morton. Gangsters did an interview where they brought out uh, fried chicken and watermelon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you think you couldn't even dream of doing today and it was oh, their idea according to Cornette. it was their idea exactly yeah but one thing i do remember is you know here are all these kids uh <laughs> weird trivia that i remember the 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 football team at saltville virginia was the saltville shakers <laughs> i did not know that there's like a bunch of you know kids from the high school sitting in the back row and um I'm, like i'm saying like a half a dozen you know and they're all just sitting watching the matches having a good time and it's a little bit loud but but that's cool and when tammy came out and she'd already been in smoky for a year or two you know yeah. when tammy came out in saltville i have it I, I heard some hooting and hollering i turn over i turn around i look at these these six guys they all they were kind of just like sort of laying back, you know, all very casual. When she came out, they all collectively sprung to attention. You know, it was nothing. It, it was like something out of a cartoon. They all got stiff <laughs> at once. They're like boing. I was going to say you sprung and stiffed at the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, seriously, they're all kind of just laying back, and when she walked out, they all sat straight up all at once. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> My, I have two Saltville, Saltville stories, okay? I, I don't think I have told these stories on this podcast before. I think I told them on the 605, but if I'm repeating on my own podcast, sorry. Um, number one, we stop into McDonald's, okay? And by the way, when you're on the road in this area, McDonald's is cuisine. The food, I don't know if it's changed. People tell me it has, but the food out there was freaking horrible. I mean, these, yeah. these people couldn't even get pizza right, okay? So we stop at McDonald's, and my friend buys some meal that comes with a Barbie doll, right? Oh, right. So I'm like, <laughs> so I'm like, dude, you know, give me the Barbie doll. And I give it to Mark Hildebrand and I, Brian Hildebrand. Excuse me. I'm, I'm 
crossing Mark Curtis and Brian Hildebrand. I'm like, give this to New Jack and tell him it's a peace offering from the fans in Saltville, Virginia. You should have seen the look <laughs> on, on Brian's face. I'm like, go ahead, do it. He loves so, it. So yeah. New Jack comes out his first match with this Barbie doll in his mouth. And he spits oh. it out. He, he, he thought it was serious. <laughs> and number two, and I hope I, I in my own weird way, I hope Jim Cornette remembers this, even though he's got a million things to remember from being on the road all the time. Me and my friends, I think we're in the front row or the second row, whatever. We're right by Jim Cornette. He's out managing and we've got this all planned out. I'm like, okay, on three, ready? One, two, three. And we all start chanting, Paulie sucks. Paulie sucks. Right? Jim Cornette <laughs> turns around like acting like we're saying Jimmy sucks or Cornette sucks. And then he actually hears what we're saying. <laughs> Just another nah. tr- tr- dropper. <laughs> but oh, we had a lot of fun out there, man. I had just another quick memory of a mutual friend of ours that we all miss, uh, Harry White. Yes. Harry and I are walking around Saltville before the taping, which took about 12 minutes. <laughs> Conservatively, we're walking around Saltville. They walk into a store, and there's the evening paper. And we leave the store, and Harry's got a copy of the evening paper under his arm. And I legitimately said, did, did you pay for that paper? He says, "No, I just assumed it was free." You know, <laughs> some big city city slicker Harry White walks in, houses a houses a paper right out of the front window, and just walks with it. <laughs> Harry, who lived literally in in St. Louis and then lived literally in Austin, Texas, doesn't know how to pay for a paper. It reminds me of what's his name, uh, Jimmy Suzuki. We're in New York. This wow. is like 91, and he's not tipping. I'm like, Jimmy, we're supposed to leave a tip. <laughs> and he acts like, you know, oh, you tip here? I don't know. And I'm like, yeah, you know, 20%, whatever. And Melcher is like, ah, this is just his act. He's lived here for 10 years now. He knows better. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's great. Do you remember that guy, Marty Gorman, who was on the 94 trip? This guy, I certainly do. <laughs> he was on every, he was on every one. He came every Did year. He? And as a matter of fact, my second exposure to hardcore fans was flying down to Knoxville. We connected in Pittsburgh or whatever the hub is. Pittsburgh is Pittsburgh, a air, airline hub. Uh, I was stopped in Pitt- Pittsburgh. So it must be like on my way to yeah. Louisville, I think. Right. Right. So that's what I did. And in the waiting room, you can, you know, oh, well, there's five of us wearing wrestling shirts. You know? <laughs> I guess we're all going the same place. And it's Marty Gorman, uh, and you can expound on him, certainly. Uh, the McGee brothers, Sarge and Bob McGee, and Ron Head from California. <laughs> and that was that was an intriguing little group uh, that uh, that all first met in the uh, in the in the uh, at the gate uh, on our way to Knoxville. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, I, the, well, Marty Gorman, I mean, I, I was still pretty full of piss and vinegar back when I was 28, 29 and 94, but I largely, I tried to behave myself. Well, we're on that bus on our way out of either Saltville or Barberville, whatever it was, some tiny town hidden in the mountains. And there are people, you know, outside gathering on, and Gorman starts yelling at them, right? Oh. I'm pretty sure that was the only time on the trip I assured someone of bodily harm if they didn't knock off what they were doing right now. It's like like the <laughs> cops couldn't just pull over this bus and do whatever the fuck they wanted to do with us. I mean, I'm just you know, just right. be smarter than that. And they're not going to differentiate me from you, the guy who's yelling. <laughs> Number two... <laughs> I remember Marty, you know, like I said, whatever. We're on the road seeing Smoky Mountain Wrestling, going to Smoky Mountain Wrestling shows. This guy decides to stay home one night and watch Clash of the Champions from the WCW. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That that is the greatest story ever. And as a matter of fact, that was the night of uh, the the, the much talked about Louisville uh, almost riot. That's right. (laughs) Okay, so this was 95. Yeah, so he skipped that show 
to stay back at the hotel and watch the class. Stay, <laughs> I'm going to stay home in this hotel by myself and watch cable TV when I'm on the road with Smokey. Although, as as you just mentioned, figure him into the equation, into that Louisville equation. One of us would have gotten killed had he had he been there. <laughs> <laughs> there was something about him he he couldn't he couldn't resist. He wasn't good on names, on certain names. Uh, certainly knew all kinds of wrestlers' names, but he would associate you with whatever town you said you were from or you flew out of or something like that. Like I think I he asked me if I flew out of all wherever, and I said Albany. So for the next three years, I was Albany, you know. Hey, Albany. <laughs> yeah, it was him uh, overdoing his Brooklyn thing. That's right. Bob, Bob McGee. Now, there's a name I haven't heard for a while, or in a while. Sarge and Bob. Sarge was cool. Bob was a little bit different. Um, I remember I was with Ron Head and J.R. Benson, <laughs> and we're sitting there. Okay. Go ahead. Ron, Ron Head, if, if you don't know either of those two people, at the time, there were no two more polar opposites as as wrestling fans than uh, than uh, Bob McGee and Ron Head. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Bob was from somewhere in South Jersey. Ron was like right in the middle of San Francisco. Uh, so was J.R. Benson. And like we're sitting there. We're, where were we? I think we're at the uh, what's the place east of Knoxville? I should know this. The big arena, but not in Knoxville, the one east of Knoxville. Johnson City. Johnson City. City, Thank you. We're in Johnson City, and Jr. and Ron, who are just two funny guys, like they sit down next to me. I was sitting, coincidentally, I guess kind of close to the dressing room, me and Steve Walsh and whoever else. And they're and they're like, mm-hmm. watch this, watch the dressing room. They told Bob McGee that, oh, if you're part of Smoky Mountain Fan Week, you get to go in the dressing room. So this guy yeah. just wanders <laughs> in the dressing room. And who does he encounter mm-hmm. but Brian Lee? Just the last guy. Oh. And I see Bob come out looking like he, his air, his flight just had a, an emergency landing. He looked like he was going to piss himself. Uh, it was, <laughs> and the six of us are just sitting there cracking up. No offense to Bob. He was a good guy. And Sarge was a really good cool yeah, guy. Was- Sarge was a cool guy, and Bob has has mellowed over the over the these many years. I am glad to yeah. hear that. I, I'm certainly not yeah. saying anything bad about anybody. It was just a really funny thing, and of course and, we're laughing loud enough so that he hears us laughing and he knows what just happened. <laughs> oh come on, <laughs> wrestling wrestling is built on things like that. <laughs> Oh, I think Tammy Tammy got hot at him too because she she knew him from Philly. Like, oh, that's right. She knew him back here. You know? <laughs> I can't get away from the guy. Yeah, I don't know about you. Well, you certainly went further in wrestling. I don't think, I, to be honest, I don't think I've ever even stepped inside a wrestling ring. And I never wanted to be in the back. You know, I I, I, I was the same way. Yeah, I, I did not want to be in the back. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I've seen enough. I just felt like, you know, <laughs> I, I always knew that that's like, you know, just not my place. A lot of people couldn't wait to be yeah. in the back, hang out, whatever. Oh, no. It's like you're not supposed to be there. It's like, I, I guess, well, I don't know. I guess being in locker rooms, you know who's supposed to be there and who's not. And you just follow those boundaries. Death, I wasn't a kid, you know. I'm like, oh, man, I, look at this. <laughs> I want to go see some of the wrestlers. You know, I don't need to do that. Yeah, I know. I never, I never wanted to 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 be in the back like that, and uh, I, I was deathly afraid that, that I would be found out. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What are you doing back here? Yeah, especially the 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 few people that like to say Smoky Mountain Wrestling. You know, who's going to see me back there, Cornette? He'll know instantly. I don't belong back there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the one time I'll, I'll sidebar. I went to a WWF show in Arrowhead Pond, which in in Anaheim, which was their West Coast Madison Square Garden. What were you doing out there? I uh, went to I think we went to Cauliflower Alley okay. in Las Vegas. And then we took uh, my my friend Greg Greenland and I and uh, we got a car and drove uh, through the desert 
you know, and ended up, you know, in L.A. I've only been in L.A. one day and we went to Venice Beach. We went all over the strip. And at night we drove up to Anaheim for the show. And Greg got us tickets and we got in. And it really was so spectacular. I, if I just think about that show and the, the, the stuff that was literally everybody that you talk about a loaded show and it wasn't a pay-per-view and it wasn't a taping, but Vince was even there. Uh, Ross was there. All these people were there and there were celebrities. Uh, what was the name of the, the, the Samoan rap group? Oh, the Booyah tribe. Okay. The boot. And in Anaheim and in, in Oakland and places like that, the Samoans show up to support the Samoans. And the Booyah tribe were big, giant guys. It's like the stories you used to hear about Alpha and Sika. And they were all there with all their people. They were there. And the actor, a great a fan of him that I am, Dennis Hopper. Oh, wow. Uh, w- was right at ringside, had great seats. And if any of the guys, certainly if they knew Dennis Hopper, they wanted to meet Dennis Hopper. You know, he was right in the front. Undertaker, Rock, all these people were on the show. And he was there with his son. He had, he had you know, he's an older guy, but he had a, he had a, a very young son and some other friend of his. So after the show is over, Greg says, oh, come on backstage. And, you know, and I really like, you know, where am I going to do sit in the arena? You know, I, I go backstage. And immediately I go, oh, I don't like this. <laughs> right. <laughs> and who comes around the corner? They had just been in the main event, but Rock and Undertaker, and they're laughing their ass off about something all sweaty, you know? And I go, uh-oh. You know, <laughs> nobody's looking at me. You know, nobody cares. I mean, but, you know, then I see walking in tandem, Vince, Jim Ross, and Vince Russo. And I'm going, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> please, please don't. Please don't let me get tossed out like somebody give me a give me a weird look you know whatever so i go and sit in a corner try to keep as far away from everything as possible and uh a minute or two later here comes dennis hopper uh, with his with his friend and his and his son and i can't resist i stand up i shake his hand and i say mr hopper thank you very much did you enjoy yourself and he starts raving and he's uh, practically hugging me. You know? but he's giving me the most sincere handshake. And he goes, oh, it was wonderful. You know, he's really just was going on and on, you know. Oh, how fantastic it was and all this. You know, I said, all right. Thank you. I got to uh, schmooze Dennis Hopper for a second. <laughs> now, now get me out of here. <laughs> I can only imagine me meeting Dennis Hopper. And I'd just be like, you were in the best Twilight Zone ever. You started it. And like <laughs> Dennis Hopper, three hours later, just being like, I met the stupidest person today. Ah, <laughs> I knew not to make any small talk, but I just pretended like I belonged back there for half a that second. That was good. He went, for, he went for it. That was really good. That was well thought out, sir. I remember my uh, first please. time in a ring. It was at, at an indie show in 1988, and I insisted on getting my picture taken. I got on the bottom rope, and one of my friends took my picture, and I still have this picture around somewhere. I will tr- try to find it. It's me in my dumbass 1988 br- a bomber jacket with the, the white mock turtle and the jeans, and <laughs> I, looked, I, I just looked like something out of a bad 80s sitcom. I I have to have that around somewhere. (laughs) The one other thing that I saw in Anaheim was um, John Cena in the uh, in the lobby. He was working for whatever uh, Roland Alexander's group was called back then. And he was so big and so jacked, but he radiated personality and he just had it. You could tell I'd already heard about him, you know. He, he was wrestling as the prototype. He hadn't even been to Ohio Valley Wrestling yet. But he and Christopher Daniels, you talk about two career trajectories that went yeah, really? in opposite di- opposite directions. Yeah, they were both sort of representing this group. And they, it was already a little feeder group for the WWF. And obviously, they had their eye on John Cena. I didn't know that. But people just swarmed around him and and had no idea who he was he was that charismatic and uh, you know and the rest is history 
But I wanted I wanted on the record that I spotted his charisma ah, way back then. All right. Thank, I ju- thank you. Just yesterday, I'm watching TV, and John Cena is on a commercial, like a, a national commercial that's on during the NFL. I said to myself, this oh, yeah. is something we would have never seen you know, 40 years ago growing up watching wrestling like you know even if you put aside that okay even a guy like dusty Rhodes is on uhf channels in florida even if there was oh, a yeah. national promotion you would never see a wrestler doing a commercial like that and now we're totally used to them absolutely yeah i, I hulk hogan you know i was never a favorite again i, I i'm older you know <laughs> i you know a, I was, you know, kind of out of out of school. Not not when I first saw Hulk Hogan, but certainly when Hulkamania became a big thing. You know, I was I was graduated from school. You know, <laughs> I never liked it all that much, except that, you know, when he would get that response, and it was so exciting, people were going, crowds were going wild, and you'd see him on the Tonight Show. That never happened before. Nope. You know, and it was all very exciting. You said, "What?" Wow, there's, you know, the sky's the limit, you know? <laughs> I mean, the idea of having someone like Cindy Lauper on WWF TV, not just once, she was on a bunch of times, and she was probably yeah. either she or Madonna in 84 was the biggest female pop star out there. As a matter of fact, even Madonna hadn't even broken out yet. What am I talking about? So she was, you know, yeah. she had a bunch of number one hits, and I remember being lucky enough to hang out with Bill After and Craig Peters right before the uh, Night of Champions uh, Memorial Day weekend, 84. And After's like, oh, you know, and they were right in the middle of that angle. They were saying that, um, you know, Roddy Piper and Lou Albano would be on the pit. And Albano's, oh, I'm bringing on Cindy Lauper. And she didn't show up. And Bill After's like, I don't know what they're doing. There's no way Cindy Lauper is going to Allentown, Pennsylvania to be on Piper's pit. I have no <laughs> idea what they're doing. And he was serious. And yeah. I, I believed him. I just Bill After, he he knows everything. And you know, and I just remember my my shock when she when she actually came on. Number one, you know, based on Bill After said it was never gonna happen. But number two, this is a major, major star. On wrestling. Yeah. Like, this was unheard of six months, unthinkable, six months prior. Yeah. She's got a different personality than, than True. most uh, deep divas. And at the time, she was married to or heavily involved with her manager, Dave Wolf. And I think Dave Wolf was the, was the real wrestling fan. That's what I've <laughs> heard. I've heard he, yeah. I mean, once again, the, the shock of seeing Captain Lou Albano on MTV, even for three or four seconds, which he was for the first couple of videos. And my understanding is Dave Wolf put that together that, you know, he loved wrestling and wanted Albano on the videos. And, you know, he was certainly willing to do it. Yeah. And the other the other career moves that he did for Cindy Lauper at the time all worked out really well. So, you know, why not go along with it? I'm not saying she wasn't a fan. I think that the, the story of how they met is actually pretty true. They met on an airplane and Lou was funny and she liked talking to him because he's this outrageous personality, you know? Yeah, I, I can totally see that. I, I, oh, I yeah. can, but I question it a little bit. It, it sounds better. Then yeah, it's just something my manager put together. He likes wrestling. I, I, I'm I'm not saying it's true or it's not true. I don't yeah. know. No, yeah, yeah. People like to tell the story. They said, "Oh, that that hurt her career." I don't. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> she looked like she did okay. You know, <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Yeah, that album couldn't have been any hotter at the time no. that she was doing all that wrestling stuff. You know, no. I mean, that was a a major major release. But I did watch, and this is like twenty years ago. Uh, VH1's behind the music on Cindy Lauper, and she flat out said that she regretted doing it. That she thought it hurt huh. her long term. Which you know, again, nothing was bigger for her than the first album. She's so unusual, but yeah. You know, yeah, right. she flat out said, yeah, I think that was a mistake. And, oh, and yeah. you know what? I remember, like I said, 20 right. years ago, I don't want to say my feelings were, were hurt. They weren't. But I was just like, oh, man, that's not <laughs> what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear, you know, that she yeah. had a good time, but she didn't. Yeah. 
But uh, well, so, sorry for that uh, that detour. <laughs> oh, this has been this has been the detour show. And I'm very happy yeah. about it. for for those. Oh, you're all unaware. Yeah. Scott and I we had a plan. We're going to talk about 1992 Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and we just started talking, and we were not getting anywhere near 1992 Smoky Mountain Wrestling. All so right. I I kind of paused and I said, Scott, let's just do what we're doing. I mean, I'll, I'll have that show some other time, and I yeah. mean. I am having nothing but fun right now. And, of course, the hour is almost over. As you do these quarterly updates, I will never be asked back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do, do we have time to talk about Ron's championship wrestling? We definitely do. We and yeah, how many times have you been on this show? Uh, three, maybe. Oh, I think it's been more than that. I think it's been more like uh, it only seems more like five or six. It only six. seems like more. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I had you on when uh, Sean was the co-host. He couldn't make it once. And I had you on a oh, bunch of right. times that's after right. that. So I, I don't think this is the straw that's going to break the camel's back. But please talk about Ron's <laughs> championship wrestling because I am unfamiliar with this. There's a guy that has put up the most incredible, obscure regional pro wrestling tapes over the last couple of years. His name is Chris. I'm not sure. He goes by the name Chris P. Lettuce on Twitter. Yes. And on YouTube, he's, he posts under the name Armstrong Alley. And where he gets this, he makes you look like a piker, your old, uh, your old uh, <laughs> tape collection, because he finds stuff that I literally have never heard of ever. It's so incredibly obscure. I mean, Southern promotions where they're literally talking about working one town, you know, and they just have some sort of UHF wrestling show uh, from from areas that just stagger stagger the uh, the mind. Uh, but check out Armstrong Alley; that's a free plug for him. He deserves it. But earlier this year, he started posting, and he now he's got about two dozen episodes up of Ron's Championship Wrestling. Ron's Championship Wrestling dated from 2002, 2003. And Ron in Ron's Championship Wrestling is Ron Wright, the Tennessee Hillbilly. Oh, wow. Who, who was a manager in Smoky Mountain Wrestling and uh, in the early, in 92, to, to bring it back around. Uh, <laughs> we can't even keep our detour straight. Yes, thank you. But uh, Ron Wright was uh, a classic regional wrestling character uh just one of those legendary names i mean and he never really left tennessee east not even full tennessee east tennessee he almost never left it there and if you can imagine smoky mountain ends in 95 you know Cornette had various reasons he just couldn't draw in some of these towns uh couldn't get clearances on tv in the towns that he wanted him Monday Night and Wars started. Monday Night Wars, and he was getting pulled in a different direction. I don't think, I think Smoky Mountain Wrestling, he would have been very happy. It was really in his heart to stay there. But the, the, the economy was bad, you know, all these things. And so rather than just bleed Rick Rubin forever, he just said, I, we're just throwing money, you know, down a pit, you know. Well, really quickly, uh, Scott, um, my understanding is he lost Ruben about a year before he, maybe less than a year before he pulled the plug. Yeah. But he had another person who was willing to, who was looking to invest That's in the promotion. Right. And Cornette, yeah. and I think this showed a lot of integrity on Jim Cornette's part, was like, you know, yeah. As much as he wanted to keep the dream alive, he felt like it just wasn't going to happen. He, he kind of told this guy not right. to waste his money. That's right. So that's 95. In 2002, one of Cornette's arch enemies in, in Lower Tennessee, uh -oh. a dude named Terry Landell, yep. starts. He's had various other. At the time that Cornette was doing Smokey, Terry Landell had an outlaw promotion on TV called Tennessee Mountain Wrestling which is is a, a ripoff to start that, that, that didn't endear him. to. Uh, that's not going to cause any marketplace confusion or anything. And all of this stuff. And and if somebody like a, exactly like a Ricky Morton were on the outs with Smoky Mountain and then 
later that same week, he turns up on Tennessee Mountain Wrestling. They had a very adversarial uh, relationship. Oh, to say the anyway, least, that, but go ahead. <laughs> to say the least. But so here in, he, he ran various promotions. And in 2002, somehow come, comes up with the idea. I guess it was his idea because he seems to be the main guy behind it. Or Ron's Championship Wrestling, which they taped up in that area, up in East Tennessee. And if they didn't have TV tapings, they were like the Savoldi promotion. They would just run other people's, or, or ICW. They would just run other people's tapes, you know? They'd say, oh, we've got so-and-so coming in, you know, Bob Armstrong. Then they'd just show a Bob Armstrong Smoky Mountain tape, you know, <laughs> or, or something like this. Oh. But they had their own they had their own promotion, and who are they using? Five years after Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Tim Horner, Dirty White Boy, <laughs> uh, Killer Kyle, you know? <laughs> and and some of their own homegrown. And this Terry Landell, who is severely charisma deprived, is all over that show. And he's doing a heel act, you know? <laughs> and then Ron Wright is there on commentary. And Ron Wright, who had great charisma in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, comes off as just like an ornery, very old wrestling fan. You know, he'll be sitting at the at the commentary table, and Dirty White Boy, his one of his proteges is in the ring and be get him, white boy, get him, white boy, you know <laughs> this kind of thing. You know? Every ad on the show on Ron's Championship Wrestling is either for Ron Wright's wrestling school or for a local bail bondsman, the Tennessee Bonding Company. Oh, man. It, it's unbelievable. You know, and, and it, you know, I'm, I'm not saying there's nothing worth watching on there, but there's there's nothing worth watching on there. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, yeah, the Tennessee Bonding Company is appears to be their major sponsor. And at one point, they add a banner. You know how they'd put, like, the banners on, on the, the ring uh, skirt oh, on no. the apron? It says... Tennessee Bonding Company, if you're put in jail, call, and then they have the number. And and that's visible on their TV every week. From the hard cam, I'm and, sure. And on the hard cam, absolutely on the hard cam, yeah. And then, like I said, every ad is for the Tennessee Bonding Company. Terry Landell is either at ringside doing heel commentary or at the ring running around as a heel manager. But what's what's just crazy is that it really it couldn't have existed without Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And I've never, ever heard a word about it until the until this uh, Armstrong Alley started posting these things. I never saw it. The Observer never saw it. The Torch, you know, they, its existence was completely and appears to last it at least a year or two. <laughs> Ron's Championship Wrestling sounds like a 1970s Saturday Night Live skit. I I don't want to make it sound too good, but <laughs> check it out. <laughs> because you're going to go, what the hell is this problem? This is awful. <laughs> you know, Scott, we're, we're out of time, and thank you for sharing that. I, I used to have a conversation with a guy, with Chris Cruz, and we we had this conversation for like over an hour. Do guys like Terry Landell, do they create the the uh, culture of the wrestling business, or does the culture of the wrestling business create the Terry Landells of the world? <laughs> it it definitely draws them in. Whether what whether it's somebody that you end up loving, like a Dennis, <laughs> yeah, or 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 a Terry Landell, or uh, even less savory characters. I agree. It's the culture of the wrestling business that creates these guys. Only in wrestling, as they always say. Scott, it has been a fun hour, and I bet it's going to be a fun hour for everyone to listen to. Thank you for returning. I hope so. Thanks. Oh, uh, b before I go, I have plenty of material for the upcoming Stick to Wrestling uh, uh, roast of Richard O'Sullivan. <laughs> yeah. I should have turned to you, you for that, but um, unfortunately, no, it yeah, had to come from the heart. Did you see his IMDb page, the the same place I did in a fortune cookie? <laughs> no, I saw it on a postage stamp. Oh. 
on a poster stamp. Okay. All right. And with the, thanks for having me uh, here. You're very welcome. I want to thank everyone for listening. We'll be back next week. I want to thank uh, Brian Last for uh, giving me this podium. And I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all the great work he does, not only producing the show, but being uh, yes. flexible as he is as far as like recording times and stuff like that. Thank you very much, Lou. As he's known in the, in the industry now, Las Vegas Louie. Las Vegas Louie, you got it. Yeah. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Go Vols, beat LSU. This concludes our podcast day.